Good afternoon. Cities are really good. They are the most sophisticated and complex creatures, organisms that humankind has created so far. Look around you. You are here in a so-called smart room, in a smart building, in a smart city, and surrounded by smart people. It seems like we have reached peak smart. But we want to go one step further. Think about how your city communicates with you. Is it something like this? You drive into the city on a sunny day and suddenly, flash, you get caught by speed trap. We think this is not a very communicative way to uh, welcome you to a city, but it happens every day. Think of other things that could happen around in your city. Some people have big problems with too hot buildings, so they add air conditioners to the outside. This is an example from Singapore, of course, where it's much hotter than here. How do you solve this problem? In this case, maybe you can talk to your neighbor or to the city, it will be difficult. Or you have a situation like this in Vietnam, we have lots of things that connect the city's network, but it's done in a way that is really obstructing your view or even dangerous. For all these situations, we should find a better answer. The smart cities of today, they focus mainly on smart mobility, smart buildings, smart infrastructure. But are they really interactive? And are they really people-centered? Because you want to interact with your city. These are typical screens you get when you look up smart cities in the world. This one is from Songdo in Korea where you see few people sitting behind monitors, observing other people, other situations in the city. There's a, a tremendous amount of data generated, smart data, big data. If we try to define a smart city in a brief term, it would be big data plus information and communication technology, or ICT. Smart cities are supposed to make people happy, and this has a long tradition. Already three, four hundred years ago, there were books written about that. And the governors, the governance of a city always tried to make their people happy. At this time, there was no smartness in the system as such, but the people had to be worked with. And the governors and the rulers tried to find ways how to engage the people and make them more happy. This treaty from 1749 from Muratori is just one example. How about today, if you come back to the smart building, probably have experienced that also already, you're sitting in a room and suddenly sun shades are coming down, you do not exactly why, then you get upset and somebody tells you, but it has to be like this, this is a smart sunshade, it's supposed to do that. But as you can see from this building here in the background, some do, some don't, it's kind of not working all the time. This brought some people to the fact that they want to abandon this whole idea of smart homes or smart rooms. Kent Larson said already four years ago, I don't believe in smart homes. That's kind of a bogus concept. All of us, all of you who try to implement one of those will have an experience which is quite remarkable. What is really missing is people in the whole system. How do we engage the people together with the technology? because people should really be in the center. That's how we came with this concept of the responsive city. Responsive city would be the combination of people's cognitive capacities, people's wishes, people's all kinds of things they can do, plus smart city technology. This is quite a long way to get there, but some cities are well advanced. You can only do that if you do learning before, if you do studying. So you look at best cases where it has worked before. You go there, you study it with other people, that's best. And also you have to have the possibility to give input. To give input to the city, to your surrounding. Here we see a researcher giving input to a city, in this case Singapore, how to overcome the urban heat island effect. You also have to decide how do you want to live. Do you want to live in high-density environments like this one here in Asia or like this low density in the US and Los Angeles? Or do you want to go to another phase? For example, turn everything into 
electric transportation do away with emissions and sounds and so on and do it like the people in Zermatt in Switzerland decided to do it. Imagine already 1946 they decided to build these kind of vehicles themselves to avoid the noise and all the other problems of transportation in their village. So we have now very two extreme situations. We have the electric cars and we have the horse carriages and the whole village is living and functioning with these modes of transportation but very successfully. I'm not advertising that to, do, to be done everywhere. But we have to look at the contradictions that we have created ourselves in the last years. Never before we have been as educated and as knowledgeable as today. Yet we do strange things. We know that we do exceed our CO2 limits, but we fly for a few days to the Maldives, spending as much or setting free as much CO2 as you drive an SUV for 20,000 kilometers. Or we have beautiful, livable cities like Vienna, or Munich, or Zurich. And in these cities, on average, the person per year produces more than seven tons of CO2. At the same time, our universities go to other countries and teach those countries how to do sustainable design. And these countries, these cities, they produce much less CO2. So there are lots of contradictions we have in there. So cities must become responsive, but why? Let's take a further look ahead. The big reason, the biggest reason is probably that in the next 20, 30 years, more than 2 billion people will move into cities that either are existing or that have to be built from scratch. And these 2 billion people, of course, don't live in Europe or North America. They live mostly in Asia and in Africa. And it will be impossible to build those cities at the level of emissions and consumption that we have here in order to not cause a catastrophe. The other reason is that cities have to become more responsive, meaning that you can have a give and take and really an observation of the goods and the bad things in the city is that they today emit more than 80% of the greenhouse gases, mostly from industry still, but also from transportation, from mobility that we all want to have. And therefore, we came to the conclusion we absolutely need innovation in city planning and management. For that reason, we founded the so-called Future Cities Laboratory in Singapore, and we collected there a large group of people, of principal investigators, of students, and of researchers that focus on that one theme, future cities. It has to be from different disciplines. As you can see, it started almost like in a garage in one of the basements of the university, but by now it's the largest research center of this kind. We thought about the steps we could take from smart cities to responsive cities. So let's take for a given that the smart cities have technology and infrastructure, and they can become great building blocks for responsive cities where we add citizens and their responsibility. This is extremely important. We have wonderful examples from the past without high-tech infrastructure, but where people take their responsibility to create cities, wonderful cities. We have modern examples where we have mainly technology-driven efforts. And we have examples in between where people try to build with technology a new society and a new environment. We need tools, new tools, to build these responsive cities. I want to focus only on two, because they are relatively new and they take a lot of effort to complete, as you will see. The first one is citizen design science. There's a beautiful example for this in the past. Actually, when you look around, you will find many more. But here we have citizens using science and design packed together to build structures that work and are attractive over centuries. So they are both resilient and sustainable. The equation would be citizen design science is citizen design plus citizen science plus design science. What are all these things? The citizen design 
is easy to imagine. Out of necessity, people in Rio de Janeiro had to build these informal settlements, but in a very smart and sophisticated way. They work and can be improved constantly. You can also go to Germany. Old examples of buildings, adobe and wood and slate, lasting for centuries through wars and all kinds of other catastrophes. Or in Africa, South Sudan, where people build their own buildings, you see on the right, the old ones, the new ones on the left. Or in Ladakh in India, where the citizens by themselves, organizing themselves, build these beautiful hill towns, the monastery on top, the village around it, and even the landscape around it, managed in sophisticated and very sustainable ways. The next point in this citizen design science is citizen science. The activity of many citizens under the leadership of scientists to do scientific research. That means they study the sky, they study the birds, they study other things in nature, collect this data, give it to the scientists, and together they make a new science, citizen science. Very important for the future. But people take it into their own hand. They make their own citizen science devices, like here in India, to establish communication, or here also in India to establish electricity and warm water supply. The third component of citizen design science is design science itself. This is an old discipline, old science if you want, but only after the 1960s it became very known. But even in older times you have the libraries that took knowledge made out of information and data, stored it, extracted rules, and then with these rules you could build beautiful structures like this one in Venice, which are all according to certain design rules, but combined with human people's knowledge. Another component is responsive education. Once we have this knowledge, how do we bring it to the people? So this knowledge, this responsive education has to be inclusive. We have to share, truly share this knowledge, not keep it and we have to learn from the feedback that people give us. People know how to construct, even without high technology. Here this example in Addis Ababa, in Ethiopia, shows it very well. A ramp building for con concrete structure. And when we want to do here in high-tech countries something like this, we do it like this. To move a few rocks, we have a truck and truck lifting a bagger and a bagger lifting the rocks. Very, very complicated. People know to do whole cities with very simple tools. Another example here from Ethiopia. Or local materials that they use for the future to build in these countries. And even more important, the people who did that were educated in that country and at our university. They go back and once they have built these structures, they come back to us and they tell us about the experiences and what worked and what didn't work. This is the important point. And this brought us to the recognition that we have to build a new tool. We have, uh, as you know, these massive open online courses or MOOCs that can help to democratize education. And we can use this tool to get this feedback going. So we made a whole MOOC series on future cities, on livable cities, on smart cities, next year on responsive cities, that take all this knowledge and try to bring it out into the world. There are more than 50,000, 60,000 students in these courses right now. You see the distribution literally from 166 countries are represented in this one. And there's almost no countries where not there are few people who take these courses. It's important because in many of these places there is not the university, let alone a department of architecture or planning. The first type of MOOCs we did was more like broadcasting. You have knowledge, you send it out, and there it goes. But students started to talk back. They wanted to know more. And out of this, we made a new approach. They sent images instead of answers, because they didn't know how to answer certain things, but they took images and sent them back. Much more strong than maybe some multiple choice answers. So that led us to the next stage, and we tried to integrate all this feedback from these people into our teaching. And suddenly we developed a new tool with which we jumped across a barrier because before always we did research programs to use in teaching. With this approach suddenly we turned it around and we used teaching programs to use in research. 
Because what do people do? We, with this, we constructed a citizen design platform. Hundreds of people could suddenly design, attack a certain design problem here in South Africa and make proposals for that. And they could call comment on this design they made or somebody from Mongolia or from München did for that particular site. They could start to vote on this design and select the best one, a much more inclusive way of looking at something than before. You might think this is all in the future and it's crazy. It's not, because we have done some of this without knowing the word before. This one science city at ETH Zurich was such one thing because we asked people very specifically before how they wanted their campus to be designed. We listened to them. Every time we did not listen to them, we had big problems, protests and so on. So it was important to listen to them because people know best how they live and how they want to live. Few take home messages. Future cities must be livable and responsive. We have to learn, uh, recover, rediscover that responsibility is the foundation of responsive cities. That we have to do responsive learning. It doesn't come for free. We have to take serious the citizen design science. A city is not a hotel. It's something that we all have to contribute to and that we can change. So we have to move from complaining to designing. And for that, the cities will give us platforms and these platforms we can develop here at the universities. We can make proposals to make parks, not to complain about a bad situation, make a good proposal, learn how to negotiate. It is important that you know the people who can change things and how you can change them together. This negotiation skill, very important in the future. We have some advice to the governments of the city. Listen to the citizens, give them this platform because they will really work, they will love to work on this and you will get the best advice from them. The university get the advice, do research, do very honest broker research, pure research so that it can be taken up by the citizens and used. And to the citizens, be responsive. Really work in these courses, work in your city, and work together with your other co-citizens. Here's an example from all the citizens working on the design project that you saw before in South Africa. To end up, let us make our future cities the best and most responsive places humanity has ever built, lived, and worked in. And of course, let us start here in München with Responsive München. And thank you very much. <laughs>